So Richard, we've added our tools. Is it finally time to start creating some toolpaths? <laughs> yeah, you can finally start putting some toolpaths on Fusion. Okay, so we're gonna start off, we've already faced our part off, we're now gonna think about drilling. So we've got all these holes that are drilled and tapped on our component. So what do you know at the moment about drilling and tapping? I mean, I've used a drill before, okay. so I've got some, uh, some prior experience yeah. here, but I'm willing so to So how much threading more. have you done? Have you done different types of threading? I've used uh, like a manual... Hand tap. Hand okay, tap. perfect. Yeah. Very similar process. We'll go through a couple of differences as we go. So let's actually choose a drilling toolpath now in Fusion um, and look at some of the options that we have within there. Let's choose our tool first. So these are M5 tapped holes. That needs a 4.2 millimeter pilot drill. That's it. Cool, that's and that's the one we there. created earlier. Perfect. Now let's go into our geometry tab and choose the whole faces. Okay. That's fine. And a little top tip here, if you go select same diameter, that's gonna select everything on that part with the same diameter hole. So it saves you having to choose all those holes again. Now, finally, let's go into our passes tab at the end and look at all of these cycle types. Let's choose some of the most common ones. Drilling rapid out. That's the default one we choose. And as it suggests, your tool will go to the start of the hole. It will then use its feed rate to drill the whole depth. And then at the end, it will wrap it out again. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Why wouldn't you want to do that? The big problem with drilling is what we call swarf evacuation as well as heat. Yeah. The deeper the hole you try and drill, how do you get that swarf out of the hole? It's a yeah. big, really big problem. So there's something called peck drilling that you can do. Okay. So if you look in there, you see where we've got sort of chip breaking, parcel retract, deep drilling, full retract. That's going to effectively peck at the hole. So it's going to, let's have a look at the partial retract. Your pecking depth there. So you're choosing how far down do you drill before you either stop and let the swarf come out naturally, or do you retract and try and draw that swarf out? Got That's it. really important there. So this is gonna drill my holes in a series of one millimeter. Yeah, for steps. example there, that would be that. I mean, I'd probably go a little bit deeper yeah. um, on there. So what you need to think about is, do you need to do this? Do you need to peck drill, or can you drill all the way? I mean, look at the size of this drill. Yeah. You know, that's a 10 times D drill, yeah. very long, but I could drill a hole that deep in one go. Yeah. Any idea how? So, I mean, you look at it and it looks like it's designed to kind of pull the swarf out yeah. through these channels. Uh, Anything else? Do you notice any tiny holes in the back or front end of it? Ah, well, I do now. Okay, you do now. Perfect. Right. This tool is through spindle coolant compatible. Okay. So we haven't actually got that on the machine we're using, yeah. but some machines have the ability to blast the coolant, not just around the drill, because think, well, this is going down inside of a hole, splashing coolant here is doing nothing down here. Mm -hmm. So this jets the coolant down through the tool, yeah. all the way down, right at the cutting tip. That's not only amazing for cooling, but the act of doing that forces all the swarf back up and out the hole. Got it, so we solve both problems at once. Yeah, really. a cooling and a swarm evacuation. Yeah. You know, we can take this drill and we can drill the full depth in one go, no problems. Okay, wow. That's amazing for tool life. Yeah. So yeah, a little thing there about how you can look at different tools and different features to do things effectively. Got it. So we don't have one of those. So how can I no. choose a reasonable pecking okay. depth or know if I can get away with using a rapid out so I know from experience, and you're gonna to have to learn this as you sort of developing as a CAM programmer, these holes are shallow enough to get away with just a deep drill, just a drilling cycle. Yeah. We don't need to peck, we can just go in once and retract again. Got it. So let's put that back to a normal drilling cycle and press okay. That's something you're gonna get a feel for as you increase your ability as a programmer. How many times D can I go? So if it's a 10 millimeter drill, how many times 10 can I go before I start needing to peck if I haven't got through spindle coolant? Yeah. So we've now pre-drilled all these holes ready for tapping. You said before that you used a manual tap mm -hmm. and you were going in. Was it a fun process? Um, it would take a while to do a lot of holes, let's yeah. put it that way. And one of the big problems is how do you keep it straight? Yeah. So the big thing, of course, we've got, our machine is very straight, very rigid. 
So this is a form tap. So this tap here will cut the component as it drills down through, and it's going to create a tap hole perfectly. The interesting thing here, because this is doing both the diameter and the pitch at the same time, you need to feed the machine at the right pitch so you actually cut the tap properly. Yeah. The problem can be is if you get any swarf build up in the part, you can snap these very easily. Okay. So tapping is always a bit of a precarious process, yeah. especially in harder materials. Yeah. The thing here is it's doing all of the force at once because it's machining every flute is machining the full threaded hole at one go. The force is very high on what can be a very weak tool. Mm -hmm. So we have another process that we could look at doing. Okay. This is going to be fine for our application here. We've got aluminium, relatively soft. We've got good coolant. Um, it's not too much of a smaller tool. However, let's say you're doing either a very large hole. You know, let's say you're doing a 40 millimeter hole in a part. Yeah. You don't want a 40 millimeter tap. Or let's say you're doing a four millimeter hole in titanium. You don't want to be tapping that. So this is called a thread mill. Okay. So thread mills run a bit differently. Rather than them creating the hole in one go, this is going to spin like an end mill. And then you're going to interpolate a helix to actually cut that thread gradually wow. as you go down. Yeah. So that takes a lot of the load yeah. that's experienced by the tap and sort of spreads it out throughout the cut. Right. Not as fast, yeah. but a bit more flexible then in what you can do. Yeah. So that tap there can only do an M5 hole at a 0.8 millimeter pitch. Mm -hmm. This thread mill, if I have a quick look, is a 1.5 mil pitch. It can do any diameter, as long as you can get the tool in, of a 1.5. So again, we said, if you've got a big collar that's a 40 mil diameter, you'd be using a thread mill to make the thread in that collar as you go around. So in general, is it a rule of thumb that we would use a tap tool where we can get away with it? I mean, personally, they're normally cheaper, they're quicker, they're more readily available but they can be weakened and breaking them is a problem. If you break a tap in a part, I'm sure in your cam life you're going to, you basically scrapped your part. Yeah. Yes, you might be able to extract it, it's very difficult. Yeah. So snapping taps is not something you want to be doing often. Got it. And especially on a high value part that we can't afford. Exactly. You might even think about the order you tap in. Let's say you've got a high value part, you might want to tap it early on in the process rather than at the end. Imagine you spent seven hours machining a high value titanium aerospace component, and then the last thing you do is snap a tap in it, you're not going to be best pleased. So you might even consider the order, tap it early on in the process if it's a high risk operation. Perfect. Right, so that's a little bit about drilling and tapping. Let's do a bit more programming, and then we can jump on the machine and run some tool paths. First things first, let's bring our work holding models that we had earlier, the base plate, the risers, the vices, let's bring that all in now to our document. So let's drag that across. And this has all been created earlier, which is nice. So we've got that in place. Yeah, so we've created all these earlier. We can now join them into place. So I need to create a joint for me from the top of the base plate in the center to the top of our components in the center again. So flip that joint up. Now, I want you to go negative 186. That's the distance between our base plate and our jaws. And now our stock is another 82, so another negative 82. Perfect. That's exactly where we need to be now to have our voice and our stock all modeled up together. Brilliant. Could you head into the manufacturing tab and we're going to make that into a setup? So you can see now everything's visible, but don't worry, we'll be toning that down. Let's create a new setup. Okay. First things first, let's choose our model. What are we trying to machine that tank? Next thing, our fixture. So rather than choosing all those bits separately, head over into the browser and just choose the container component with everything in. Perfect. We've got a milling setup. The orientation at the moment as model orientation is correct. It's pointing in the right direction. It's actually at the top center of our block, which is fine because that's how we're going to datum our raw block. We're going to go top center. Next thing, let's go on to our stock. 
Let's do a thick sized block. I cut you a piece of material that was 380 by 122 by 82. The last thing is our post processor tab. This is going to be our datum offset number. So in our machine, when we datum the top middle of our block, we're going to give it an offset number. The machine that we've got, G54 is offset 1, G55 is offset 2, and they go on. So we're going to datum G54, which is why we've got offset number 1 set here. The most important thing you'll ever do, make sure that number matches the machine. If not, you'll be machining in the wrong place and potentially having a big problem. Brilliant. Let's hit OK. Perfect. We've now created our first setup. Let's put a toolpath on there and let's get some NC code ready to run. Let's do a facing toolpath. Let's choose our 50 millimeter face mill. And just hit OK. That's all you should have to do. Right. I now need to create me an NC program or we can use our post processor to get our NC code. Okay, so what exactly is a post processor and what is it doing? Okay, very good question. So a post processor is like our intermediary between Fusion and the machine tool. So we've got our toolpath here on our machine tool. It's made up of yellow, green and blue lines. Our machine tool doesn't think in yellow, green and blue lines. It thinks in specific G code. Our post processor takes that toolpath, translates it into the right G code for our machine so we can run it on the machine tool. You would have a specific post processor for your machine and your controller. I look at the machine tools behind me and over there, they all have different post processors. You need to get the right one for your machine. And where exactly do we get a post processor from? Okay, so we have an online library of post processors. Um, that is a, a repository of free posts that you can use. They are either perfect for your machine or they're a good baseline to do some edits from there. So if you go to manage and go post library, you can then go Fusion Library, and you can search what we've got here. So what we've got here, we've got a Haas with a next generation control on it. So copy that post from our library and put it into my local library so we can use it. Brilliant. Let's now go back into our browser and let's create an NC program from that facing toolpath. Cool. So how do I do that? I right click here, do I? Yeah, and go create NC program. Brilliant, we've got our correct post processor chosen. Um, let's call it the file name. Um, so rather than the number, just edit the name. And we want to be there calling it, oh, I don't know, facing. Hit post, and if we view that NC code, you'll now see the G code needed for our machine. So we've got G1s for linear moves, we've got M6s for tool changes, all the codes that our machine tool needs to run, we've now got from Fusion in that code. Amazing, so this here, this is something that the machine will understand, you have to drive it, to control the machine, to create the facing operation that it's created. Exactly. Okay, so let's send this over to the machine and finally cut some metal. Definitely, let's go. So Pete, it's an exciting moment. You've got your first little bit of NC code, you're ready to run. Let's go for it. So let's plug that USB stick into the machine and we're gonna transfer the file across. Something I'd always recommend is transferring it from the USB onto the memory of the machine. Um, someone could come along and take the USB stick out while you're machining, that's not good. So transferring over is always safe. So I want you to go list program, find your NC code, your USB stick, and then F2 to copy that into the internal memory of the machine. Something I'd also recommend is networking the machine. That's gonna allow a fast, smoother process in transferring the data from Fusion to start running it. Brilliant, you all copied over? Yeah, that's on now. Perfect, so now it's actually copied onto the memory. You need to select it as the active program. So you can see select program just there next to list program. Perfect, we've got that. 
So, memory mode, make sure you're about to run. Just there for me, perfect. Don't worry, you'll soon learn where all the buttons are. Right, so we're gonna run this now, not just yet, a few things for safety first. Not your safety, the machine safety. We know you're all good. So before you hit go and have this big crescendo of movement where the machine's gonna kick into life, let's just slow things down a second. What's the most common things to go wrong and what are the most important things to check? So let's check our offset number. Yep. Can you tell me what offset is on line N40? Okay, so I can see here on the left, the, the G code that we had on the yep. screen earlier. Looking down on N40, I can see G54, which is what I remember us having. Exactly, so. we had offset one, G54. That's right, perfect. Now, what tool have we got selected on line N25? Okay, so N25, I can see T1. T1, tool one. Yeah. That was exactly what we had set up in Fusion as well. Those are my two top tips for the most common problems we see. The offset number's wrong or the tool number's wrong. Maybe you've got the tool number wrong in Fusion. Maybe you've got the wrong NC code loaded on the machine. Another very common problem. Okay, so we're happy with that. And again, no start just yet. When you press start, that machine's gonna kick into life. Do you know what you're expecting to see? So what I'm expecting is the facing operation. Yeah. I can remember the roughly where it's gonna go and okay. start the machine. So I'm expecting which, it to take a bit off the start. start so I believe it'll be this back right nearest me. Okay, so first thing, we haven't got the face well in the spindle, so we're gonna to expect to see a tool change, and that's where we want it to go. Always check that, make sure you know what you expect to see, saves any nasty surprises. And the very last thing before I let you hit start, I know you want to, rather than the machine kicking into life at 100% rapid, some machines are all very fast, let's slow things down. So, go on to handle feed race and then slow the feed rate right down to zero. Perfect. You're now ready to hit cycle start. Go for it. Okay. Brilliant. The machine will do nothing because you're at 0% feed. Let's crank that up again and let the tool change happen. Now the machine's gonna move into position. Most likely the coolant's going to come on if you have it. So I'd even recommend turning the coolant off for that first move just so you can see things a little clearer. On some machines, the coolant just covers the screen completely. Perfect. Pete's been nice and gentle now on that feed rate, making sure he knows where it's going, making sure it's not going too far down, maybe a tool offset's done wrong. Perfect. Now the cut's in place, Pete, I would recommend having a hand on feed hold and a hand on the feed rate. There we go. So then you just know exactly what's going on. You've got a clear view and you're in control. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and click to watch the next video.